this uh, Max says it's trying to see tiring to see such unbridled optimism in the face of reality. Uh, Max, as a lot of people go too far with the pessimism though, and I, I think um, it does bother me as well. I'm not necessarily saying Atronach is here, but um, some people do, and I think uh, what you might miss with the optimism is it's not just about do we believe that the most likely answer is this optimistic one? Not necessarily. Sometimes yes, but not necessarily. Often we want to pay attention to the optimistic one for a few reasons. Firstly, because it sets a target to aim towards. And secondly, because it moralizes our own side, which increases the amount of good that we can get done in general. So I think from my position as a, uh, as a speaker on these things, to whom some people listen, I think I kind of had, have an obligation to be more optimistic than the average. I think I would be, it would be a disservice to my community and to the culture war itself if I was pessimistic. Um, the fact that I sort of naturally tend towards optimism helps with that. But, and I, I, think, I don't think I ever take it to the point of blind optimism either, but people are welcome to tell me if they think I am. Emu says, we require the Chad optimism preachers for anti-demoralizing reasons. I think, I think that's correct, yeah. I think demoralization is the strategy of our enemy, and so it makes sense that a bit of moralization on our side will be helpful. Dekra says, asking questions and pointing out possibilities that are well known to happen. Now, the thing is, it depends what the conclusion you're making is based on those suppositions. Um, because right now they're suppositions, but if you're saying that you don't trust the entire venture because of some other policy they did that's bad, that's, that's a bit far. Um, if you're saying that um, last time he did this, it, it, it wasn't what he said it was, or last time he did something similar, or like, look at these policies in a similar area that did, that did it completely wrong, or look at all these policies that were deceptive um, or that were dishonest, like that would, that would, that would be a, a matter for concern. But the, the Jewish censorship thing, we know, unfortunately, that a lot of the right in the US are on that train. It's not a good train to be on, and maybe it implies that they're bought. But I don't think it's all. I think it's just a, a lingering bias that might even disappear relatively soon, but it's showing no signs of it yet. Um, so I don't think it's reasonable to connect that to a total distrust of a person and what he's doing, especially when what you've seen of that thing that he's doing has been good so far. Yeah, as Wes says, being skeptical, um, being dubious uh, makes sense, but you take it too far, you go towards uh, cynicism, nihilism. It, it doesn't help you or anyone else. Um, you're going to be proportionate. Like what I said about optimism being inherently more helpful um, it applies in reverse to pessimism, um, I think, uh, for the culture war. There may be some situations where pessimism reveals to you dangers that you didn't know about before. And so I think pessimists should exist, but the discourse should not be. The, the, the discourse among pessimists should continue until they, they, they have a suspicion. They shouldn't just doubt every good option that comes up. <laughs> like, that's taking it too far. Use your pessimism for practical purposes. The optimism is in, in, in and of itself useful. Um, especially when I am not saying, oh, we should trust him, he did something good. We should trust him completely, he did something good. Whereas the opposite of that is saying, we should, we should completely distrust him because he did one thing bad. I'm not going to that extreme, and I think uh, the pessimists shouldn't either. Well, Max, voting is just a reflection of the public will, and the public will will ultimately reflect in what groups, be them big or small, who actually make a tangible, real difference do. Uh, getting people together who are competent would require a larger pool of, of potential talent who believe the same way, and so moralizing the public to your opinion, you, to win hearts and minds, is necessary, even when. The actual mechanism of change is like a group of 10 people in the end. You still need the public will, not only to initially find those people, to have the safety to find those people, but also to hold the, 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 the power once you've gained it. So public will is, is central to everything we do. And vote, vote, yeah, dropping the paper ballot in the box is not the important part. It's the will of the public that it represents, that it signals, that matters. So the, the, the whole like vote harder attack is sort of belies a fundamental misunderstanding of not just democracy, but of human nature. Um, Max says, I think the energy is better spent on building parallel societies. Do both. That's, uh, I, in, in a sense, that's what cabal is. It's not quite, you know, a physical in, in person parallel society, but these days there isn't a huge difference. Um, at least not as much as there used to be. Um, so yeah, do both. 
but if you're not interested in taking measures to cure society, um, to repair it, to replace those evil through legitimate means with those who are better, if you're not willing to do that, then what exactly are you doing? Because at that point, if you've totally lost faith that the system can be repaired, then why aren't you organizing for violence? Those, if, if those are the only two ways to solve the problem, I'm not saying you should either, um, but uh, parallelism, as you said, that is curative in much the same way that voting is. Both can work as well. And voting has been incredibly powerful. Merely the threat that the people can put someone into power who is not part of the establishment has radically changed how they behave. You notice how timid they are to go too far, to start just like wiping people out en masse. They do it in a little, little tiny segments whenever they can manage to find some faux legitimate reason. But there's a lot of things they don't do. They haven't literally just killed Trump yet. They're not, they're not all powerful. They are very afraid of the power of their opponents, especially with the, with the popularity we hold. So never doubt the possibility that merely by changing culture, we can win. Of course, that's not all that will happen, but merely by doing that, the dominoes will be set into motion that will result in our victory. Dakwa says, immediately it comes to mind that they care about their own life more than fixing what they think is broken and irreparable, like how lifetime slaves don't just immediately suicide. I'm not sure what you mean. I'm not sure what point you're trying to make there, but I, I, I sort of begin to get what you're saying. Access because violence isn't an option either. Well, in that case, again, if you're for parallelism, then you're for the curative measures that I recommend. Um, and in that case, it sounds like you want to win legitimately. Because you're making a slightly different, different case than Aiden and Scrum are making, but if you want to win legitimately, if you want to win through changing who has power in society, uh, through rebalancing power through public opinion, i.e. like parallelism is, is essentially what that is. Um, if you want to be insulated against the opponent with the aim that you will eventually grow and replace them, that is curative. Um, you may disagree with all the possible tools we have available to us, but I would strongly rebuke you if you think that uh, democracy is useless. That democracy is, is the force they appear to be the most afraid of. They have put so much time, energy, and money into trying to uh, delete legitimate democracy. Um, of course, arguably, they're more afraid of literally people rising up with guns, especially in the US. But until that becomes a more plausible answer, democracy is the greatest threat to them. Yeah, I guess in that case, Dequel, what I would say is that, okay, so they don't want to do curative things. They don't want to destroy the thing that they think can't be cured. So the third option is inaction in the culture war, not trying to help, arguably cowardice. If you think there's a problem and you're not trying to help, not hard to call that cowardice. That's why I said on the, on the previous stream, either you're using curative, cultural, gradual, social, legitimate methods like parallelism, like democracy, like cultural change to try and fix the system, curative measures, or you believe that those are impossible to work and the only thing that will change it is direct action, therefore you'd be organizing groups to do violence, or you're a coward. And I, I don't see that there is any other option besides those three. Yeah, Dequa, giving up. Indeed, but I would say that's the same thing. Never give up, never surrender. Say what you want about Churchill, once again, but that quote is very good, um, regardless what else you may think about it. Well, Max, it's not necessarily about someone that will do literally everything we want. Do you think about how much Trump agrees with our own positions? It's probably like 60 to 80 percent. That's pretty good. And considering how popular he is as well, I'll absolutely take that. You, you must not let enemy, uh, perfect become the enemy of good. Trump is a really solid option for moving towards curing our societies. Really solid, particularly in the US. Really solid option. Um, better than what we've got here in the UK. Um, so 
that is a sensible place to put a lot of hope right now. That's where it says nihilism is surrender, and I will never do that. Yeah, I agree. Nihilism is precisely <laughs> what our opponent is trying to manufacture. Is trying to trying to sort of coax us into. I know that argument doesn't necessarily mean that we should. Well, then we absolutely must not do it then, because that's it's sort of just as in control. But still, the reason they want you to do that is because you become useless if you lose hope, useless to yourself. Um, anyone who believes that Trump is better than Biden, and then doesn't go out and vote, what use are you at that point? That is you becoming useless. Like, think how easy it is for our opponent to just convince you that there's no hope and then you stop voting, thus there's no hope, because of your actions. So, no matter how black-pilled you are on democracy, there is no good argument for you not to go out and vote. The only exception is if you're in a place that you literally have no representation, like if you're in rural California, wouldn't really blame anyone in rural California for not going out and voting. But still, as a matter of pride, I think it is, I think it is right. I think I would, in that, even though it wouldn't make any difference. And like, there are some places where you might think, oh, they won't win. But like, maybe, maybe it's usually about a 5% difference. You won't be surprised. Maybe you can help. Besides, again, it's not about dropping the piece of paper into the ballot box. It's not about, well, what will my vote do? I think if you see it more as a duty and a principle, it's one of those things where if everyone does that, society is just so much better. Um, and so be the exemplar, be what you want society to be. That is ultimately the, 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 the best thing that we can do individually for the culture war, is to be an exemplar. Advocate your ideas where it's, you know, safe to do, where you're not going to ruin your life by doing so. But advocate them whilst looking like you're a comfortable, established, confident, uh, and successful individual, an admirable individual, an exemplar. If you can demonstrate that it's easier to live with your beliefs than it is to live with the self-contradictory, propagandized nonsense of the left, that I think is the best way to actually persuade people. And be polite, be nice, be open, be generous. Um, don't, be, don't be easily triggered or easily controlled. Be magnanimous and patient. These are qualities which are difficult to exhibit. Very difficult, even for those that are socially capable, but they are in fact the correct route. They, that is like, think of, think of the ways that you persuade people. You don't persuade people by shouting them down. I mean, you can persuade them by like breaking their spirit, and the, but that's a much longer process. That's not going to happen in a short term. The only way that you're ever going to persuade people, take for example, someone who's not a strong ideological opponent, but just is sort of in the middle and doesn't know much about it, but is spouting some of the leftist ideology. How do you persuade them? You don't shout them down. You don't preach. You listen, understand, and suggest quick, simple, and devastating little sort of ideas that they hadn't thought of yet, which totally unpick the suppositions that they've made. That's how you pers and you, you be excellent. You make them think that guy was great, and then they'll associate that with your beliefs. That's the best thing individuals can do for the culture war. Uh, Wes makes a good point. Um, of course, your goal is to persuade your opponent, not, not your audience. But I'm not talking here about a debate opponent. The example I was giving was someone who is, um, who is uh, not confident, but is leaning towards the opposite side. That's how you would persuade someone like that. If someone is, is convinced of the opposite side to you, then yeah, don't bother convincing them. Convince the opponent. But then, of course, as I said, all those same things about being an exemplar, being excellent, being calm and confident, still absolutely applies there. Um, in, in a debate, you, you probably will get more support, not necessarily for how technically correct what you're saying is, but how confident and complete and, and relaxed and um, capably you can communicate it, which sounds like a, a cheap hack, but I don't think it is, because I think it's easy to it's easy to come up with something that sounds technically correct. The audience doesn't have the time to investigate that. And even if they do, well, if they do, they'll go away and investigate it, and that will help. But what they have time to do is to take the proxy of how confident and well-composed you are and how charismatic you are, because that's a proxy for a lot of things in life. Um, and whilst it's something that our opponents have practiced at very well, they still can't do it as well as a successful person from our side.
For example, DeSantis and, um, and Newsom in the same room. Newsom has practiced at faking that kind of like charismatic appearance. And he was dominated by DeSantis in that debate they had. All those Republicans lined up in 2016, dominated by Trump, who was doing it for real. The rest of them were faking it. 